from the title, which is a Catching Jesus number three. Well, the Herodians, the Sadducees, the disciples of the Pharisees all came out to get Jesus to catch him. And the Pharisees are probably thinking, well, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. So they're out to catch Jesus now. But we'll see how they do. Before we read, let's ask the Lord to bless the reading, the preaching of his word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this This is your word that you spoke to us for the blessing of your people, and we pray, O God, that you would help us. You'd help us to hear, O God. You'd help us to ingest. You would help us to proclaim the excellent mercies, the abundant redemption that there is in Jesus Christ. Help us, we pray, and all for his glory. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 34, we will work to the end of the chapter. This is the word of God where truth resides. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? What is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The Messiah. They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask Jesus another question. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So how do they fare? How do they do? Do they catch Jesus? Do they prove him wrong? No. Again, it backfires on them. And to such an extent, verse 46, no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. Silence them. Talk about a backfire that came to catch Jesus and they were caught themselves and on a very difficult subject. We've been talking about these difficult subjects past couple of weeks as prompted by Matthew's gospel. And we've read about how Jesus was tested in the area of politics with the coin of Caesar and then also with theology about the resurrection from the Sadducees. And in this week, we see that Jesus is tested in the area, 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 sound like I'm from up north there, area of teleology. Teleology. You know what teleology is? Well, it's not the study of television, okay? Someone proposed that, and that's not right, okay? If you know a little bit of Greek, you know the ology part. We all know that, right? That means the study of, but what is Tele or teleos. What does that mean? Teleos means the end or the purpose of something. And so the study of teleology is a study of the, our end or our purpose. This is like an ultimate question. This is like the, the big hairy question that gets everyone, why do I exist? Why was I created and for what purpose am I to achieve in my life? This is a a, a question that gets us all. Even young people, all the way into gray hairs, we're asking ourselves the question, why am I here? And perhaps in the older age, did I fulfill my purpose? Now, it's very, it's, it's, it's kind of, I shouldn't say easy. You can come up with the purpose and have it right. You can probably answer what the Reformation did with, right? What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and... You're learning your catechism. That's good. Enjoy him forever. That's just the first one, okay? We've got to work on two, three, and now all these other ones. Challenging. But that's just the the answer part. 
Now, here's the added difficulty for you to live according to that purpose. How are we doing with that? Ask ourselves the question now before we're in our 80s and 90s, right? Did I fulfill my purpose in life? Do you know what it is? And are you fulfilling it? Jesus, though, he always knew the purpose of man and the purpose he had for himself. And this is to draw a little distinction because Jesus knew the general purpose of man and he fulfilled that too. He lived for the glory of God and as Jesus talks about, he loved God with all his heart, soul, and mind. He also loved his neighbor. That was Jesus. Jesus was in the 16th century during the Reformation. He was at this part. This is the terms they used. But Jesus not only knew that and fulfilled that, but he also knew his, he knew his own particular end in life his purpose you ever thought about that i mean jesus is one person but with two natures and his human nature on earth had to learn just like we learn that his purpose not only was to glorify god and love his neighbor but his purpose was to do that by laying down his life perfectly for sinners he had a very particular will and he had to come to know that at some point in his life Isn't that mind-boggling? I I wonder, I'm speculating here, I'm telling you that, I I can't defend it, but I wonder if Jesus came to that conclusion, that instance when he was 12, when he was not with his father and mother, well, I should say his earthly father and mother. Perhaps it hit home then that he should stay in his father's house to do his father's will. Wouldn't that be amazing? At the age of 12, Jesus not only knew the general purpose in life, but he knew that God was his real father and he was called to lay down his life. Wow. Jesus. There's no catching Jesus. And did Jesus, did Jesus fall short on his, the particular will for his life? Never. No, he didn't. He laid it down for us. There's no inconsistency with Jesus concerning our purpose in life, teleology. No, and there's no catching Jesus. But as we come to our text today, the Pharisees think they can catch Jesus in purpose, the greatest purpose. And so, we're gonna work through our text kind of the way we've been doing. We explain the method behind it, how we show, expose the trap, but then also, we find ourselves being caught in that trap as well caught within that trap. And then I also want at the end though, at the very end, I want to show you how verses 41 through 46 really explain things. How they actually end in the right direction and in the way that the Pharisees didn't see. That's, that's our method today. So first, let me show you how this is a trap. How verses 34 through 40 try to trap Jesus. So let's look at this. Let's first consider the people, right? Verse 34, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Just pause right there. So right here, we we are brought in. Now, we need to learn about the Pharisees. Now, many of us know the Pharisees are the, the, the notorious bad guys of Scripture, right? These are the bad guys. They're doing, they're up to no good. But really, it's, it's actually, it's really sad. Because the bad guys are actually in charge of all God's people. They're the religious leaders of the day. And whereas they're calling everyone to love God, to live by his law, they're not doing so hot at all. Really, actually, if you ask them in their study, because they're scholars of the law, of the scriptures, lawyer here is the term, that's scholar or, or, or one who studies all the time. If you ask the Pharisees, what the main purpose in life for man is, they would say it's to keep the law. To them, life was all about law. It was about keeping the law, and that's the way they lived. They had rigid purification and dietary laws. They also kept the Sabbath very strictly. They tithed on everything, including the mint and dill. Remember that passage? But they also added to the 613 commandments in Scripture all these other ones. Why? Because life was all about law. That's what they wanted you to know, and that's what they wanted you to keep. And I'm so thankful, even though I know children that you 
complain about your moms and dads being very strict, they're nothing compared to these Pharisees. Nothing. These were real Pharisees. Um, be thankful that these Pharisees aren't your dad and mom, okay? So they came here, and these are the people, and they were laying a trap. And we begin to see that in verse 35 at the end, testing him, teacher, which is the greatest or the great commandment in, this, in the law? What is the great commandment in the law? So as we've been talking about, every trap has a bait and a hook. A bait and hook. So let's break down this bait part. They came to him and they were seeking to test him. This is how they're being, they have a scheme. They're not there to ask this honest question, even though this question was an honest question that people were asking in their day. Rabbis were actually asking this, but they don't have the right intent. This word testing, Matthew uses to reveal the intent of their heart that they were trying to see if Jesus would mess up. This is the same word in the book of James that's interpreted as tempting. They came to tempt Jesus. They didn't really want to ask him a question. It's all a a ruse, a scheme. They want to show Jesus, Jesus doing something wrong. And they come to him on a matter of scripture. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the scripture? They, they come to him on a scriptural matter. Now, now, mostly, you know, they're talking about a good subject, scripture, right? Wouldn't we love that all of our conversations would be about scripture? And when someone comes to you and asks you a question, you want to give them an honest answer. But they're using scripture. They want you to answer scripture. And really, this is really deceitful because they're not asking like the Sadducees did, not knowing scripture, They know the content and the teaching of Scripture, but they want to use it against Jesus. And really, this comes out with the third part of this bait, the simplicity ask. Just like the the Herodians, when they came to Jesus and asked and said, Jesus, just tell us, is it lawful or not to give this poll tax? Just tell us, be plain. That appeal is done here. Tell us, Jesus, tell us, teacher, Which is the great commandment in the law? Just tell us. Just come down. Come down from up there. Don't give us all these answers. Just tell us which one is right. But if Jesus would have answered that, if he would have gone for that bait, he would have immediately experienced the hook. Because the hook is, everyone knew this back then too. All the religious elite knew this. That once you begin to say which commandment is greater than the other, you then begin to say that the other laws are extraneous. They're not needed. And so they would, Jesus would have appeared as a liberal or a progressive and saying we don't need all this extra stuff. And so what, what all we need is just this one commandment. And they would have used that against Jesus. An appeal for simplicity comes out the hook. But they didn't anticipate, again, the genius of Jesus. Didn't, uh, pre- they didn't anticipate it. And it could have been, we could say a lot of the things we've said before. That Jesus knows scripture, the content and the teaching. He's able to, to give an answer off the cuff. He loves to bifurcate, which is a sign of genius. Okay, just to see if you guys got that. But I'm joking with that one. Okay, but we see some new points here. How is the genius of Jesus expressed here? Well, let me say this. A, Genius won't be confined. Did you notice this in general? Let me read it to you again. They asked him the question in verse 36. He answers in verses 37 and following. He says, and he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So rather than bifurcating, notice this. The Pharisees come to him with, with saying, I want one answer, and Jesus gives them a two-part answer. What does that say? Just because you come with a stupid question doesn't mean you have to answer with a stupid answer, right? <laughs> You've got to give the truth. You're asking a question, Jesus gives it, and Jesus, Jesus, genius won't be confined to their own stupidity. He knows the commandment. He knows which is the greatest, the two-part, one-answer commandment. This is part of Jesus' genius. But then also, Jesus answers this very difficult question 
with Scripture. Notice that, verse 37, as he speaks about the loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, this is actually Deuteronomy 6.5, the, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And it goes on. This is, Israel used to recount this twice a day. Jesus is telling them this. And he gives, and he, but he, this is from Scripture, Deuteronomy 6.5. And then verse 39 is another Scripture. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Another, that's Leviticus 19.18. But the genius is this. See this. As they're asking him a, a question and Jesus gives them an answer, he gives them Scripture. Meaning that if they're saying his answer is wrong, they're disagreeing with Scripture. Okay, that's part of the genius, all right? But the other part of the genius is that Jesus knows how to defeat his enemies. How do you defeat your enemies? With Scripture. You come to me with that question about Scripture, I'm going to come back with you about Scripture. You bring out your sword, I bring out my sword. And just like Jesus defeated the Satan in the wilderness, right? As Adam failed in the garden, here, Jesus beats again the Pharisees with the sword of the Spirit, the divine word of God. That's genius. But if you don't see the genius yet, for all you math lovers out there, I know there's some math and logic lovers out there, here's another part of the genius of God. Call it the C part. Genius knows the contrapositive. Let me say that again because the book fell. The genius knows the contrapositive. Do you know what the contrapositive is? Come on, you guys know this. The inverse, converse, contrapositive, right? Forgetting this, okay, right, it's all right. We'll, we'll cover it. We, it happens all the time in my household. I say to the children, if you want a dessert, you have to eat your dinner. All right? If you want a dessert, you have to eat your dinner. If you do not eat your dinner, you will not get dessert. That's the contrapositive. I'm saying the same thing but negatively. And we have to say that at my, at my, at my dinner, play, at dinner table all the time. You stress that. This, the, the not is true as well. But what Jesus is doing here, as all the commandments are negative, Jesus is actually giving the positive statement of the negative. It's genius. Because you know, all, all the commandments, you shall, not, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make any graven image, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, they're all negative. You should not murder, they're all negative, except maybe one for remember the Sabbath and honor your father and mother. But Jesus actually shows in the negativity the actual contrapositive. What is that true statement said positively? Two parts. Love the Lord your God with all your being and then love your neighbor as yourself. That's genius. It is genius. He's showing that. I mean, he's the logistician, logistician, excuse me, and the mathematical person right there. But one more thing about his genius is how he uses his answer upends them. Because the Pharisees were saying life is about law to all the people. And Jesus says, no. Life is about love. Loving God and loving your neighbor caught. The Pharisees are caught. They, they, they're exposed. Their way of life is wrong, and Jesus showed them from the Scripture that they're wrong, and they can't say anything about it. That's what we are to suppose, how verse 40 falls into verse 41. They don't say anything. Even though they came together to depose him, to, un, to show his fault, just like in Psalm 2, the Lord's king will show, you know, interesting fact, verse 34, they gathered themselves together is the same word in the, the Greek version of, of Psalm 2 that, that they assembled themselves against the Lord's anointed. Fascinating. The, the one who knew the, the Greek scriptures from the Old Testament, the Septuagint, would know that phrase and say, wow, here they are, right in front of them, trying to come against Jesus, and they will not stand Instead, they're caught. But beloved, as we move on here to evaluate the actual content of we, how Jesus caught them, we shouldn't be surprised if we're caught too. Because, you know, what Jesus said here about loving the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind, love your neighbor as yourself, doesn't just catch the law-based. It catches us all. 
I just want to show us that for a moment. Because really, we're caught here too. Let me read this verse again. Verse 37. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. What is that saying? Well, to tell you what it's saying, I'm going to tell you about something else. So I, I uh, enjoy reading. And one of the books, um, well, I shouldn't say books because it's in many of his books. But one of the authors I have enjoyed to read, enjoyed reading is Cornelius Van Til. He's an apologist. He answers those big questions. And he makes an argument in his book that there's no such thing as raw materials. No such thing as raw materials. Now, geologically, right, biologically, we can maybe argue that there are such things as raw minerals, right? Raw things. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about how when a scientist evaluates a rock or a twig, looks up and to evaluate the scars, the stars, he can't say that those things are neutral. True, our eyes and our senses, we take it in, but those things that were made, they're not just there. Those things were put there for a reason. And what he's explaining is, is that whereas the scientist, as he comes to this raw material and evaluates it and looks at it and makes his conclusions about evolution and every other thing, Cornelius Van Til says, no. He says, remember, those things were made. Everything was made by God. That rock, that twig, that stun, that star, everything was made by God. And there wasn't a thing that was made that isn't personal to God. That is, he made it for a reason. What reason is it? To declare his glory. And so really, even though the rocks are silent now, even though that the trees can't talk, really go on to talk in C.S. Lewis's book, right? Or move, whatever it is. At least we know from the birds who don't have a soul, the reason they're singing isn't just to find a mate and find and rejoice they have food. They're praising God all their days. Everything, every particle and atom in this creation is personal to God and declares his glory. Now back to you and me. Why do you think God made every particle in us? every part of our heart and our soul and our mind. God made you to glorify Him, to love Him with all your heart. But then go even further. For those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, why were you redeemed? To declare forth His glory and to love Him with every particle of your being. So i got a question for you. Are you doing that? Do you love the Lord your God with every particle of your being? Soul, mind, spirit, right? All, all, or whatever term. Strength is, is used even, even in the Shema as well. Heart. These terms express and say every part of us. Does every part of us love God? Or let's ask the question that Jesus asked Peter, really convicting him. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than being beautiful? Do you love me more than being successful? Do you love me more than your spouse? Do you love me more than your job? How are you going to demonstrate that? Boy, this is very convicting. Jesus wants us to love him more than our dreams, more than sports, more than our laws, more than anything. And see, this really catches all of us. Because there is, even this morning, we've come into to worship. There's likely something else that's catching us and distracting us and pulling us away from loving God with every part of our being. So we're caught. And we need to love the Lord more. But if that doesn't catch you, let's talk about verse 39. The second is like to it, the second part. Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I find it interesting that this is from Leviticus 19. What is Leviticus talking about, the whole book? Talking about what? 
sacrifices, law, but sacrifices that you offer up. Could there be connection between love and that being a sacrifice? Could there be a connection? The expression that the very notion of love is sacrifice on our behalf? But if we didn't get that, he ties it in even more explicitly. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Are you willing to sacrifice a lot of things for yourself? I mean, we save up money for ourselves. We give the best things to ourselves, the best gifts. I mean, we do everything for ourselves. Jesus says, I want you to love sacrificially other people like you love yourself. Boy, is that convicting. That's how we're to, we're to love one another. Do you love your neighbor that way? But let's ask, because, you know, we don't go over the, over the fence all the time, right? Do you perhaps love your spouse as much as you love yourself? Even in the hard time that you're facing. Just because you're going through a hard time doesn't mean you have to stop loving them. What about your children? Loving your children looks like loving them sacrificially, giving of yourself. What about parents loving your aged parents? Boy, that's tough, isn't it? To love your aging parents. Children, what about loving your brother and sister who puts you down? You know, Jesus talks about enemies, and I, I never thought, you know, as I was a kid, I thought that my sibling was an enemy. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about. Your sibling's not your enemy. You're called to love that sibling like yourself, sacrificially, giving of yourself for them. Is that the way you love? If it's not the way you love, then you're caught. And you're being caught by Jesus in your sin. This is sin here that Jesus is talking about. As Jesus exposed this topic of, it's, it's much easier to see sin when we talk about negatives and, and we fail to keep the negative. But when you say the positive, you say, no, well, I'm kind of close. No, it's still, if we don't do it, then we're failing, we're sinning. Jesus is exposing our sin. But beloved, today, I, I don't want you to go home and be silenced like these Pharisees. Because Jesus, even in this text, calls, not only calls them out and exposes them for their wrongness, but he also reminds them that there's one who can save them from their sins. And he does that by the following verses, verses 41. Jesus asks the question, while they're still gathered together, assembled against him, trying to figure out, well, how do we deal with this? They're, they're, Jesus says, okay, let me ask you a question. What do you think about the Christ whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. And he said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And see, what Jesus is doing there is more than exposing their error and doubling down on them and saying, you, you guys don't know a thing about the scriptures. He is more so saying, you are missing the Son of God in the Scriptures, and the one who's standing right before you. The one who's supposed to save you from your sins. As I would expose the law to you, the love that God has, and your failure to have it, I want you to see me. But they didn't want to see him. What about you? I would hope that you would want to see Jesus. Because he is the one who can deliver us. And he is the one, as Chris talked about, he is the one who's been faithful in our failings. He is the one who has done this for us. And that's why we gather. We gather together to praise God's name, not only because he is great and wonderful, yes, yeah, but he's also redeemed us. He has saved us. And I want you, in the middle of being caught, don't be silent and walk away from Jesus. Call out to him and say, Jesus, Forgive me. Forgive me for my sin. Beloved, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'll bring us to a close with this. There's a wonderful example of a man who loved God and his neighbor very well. I don't think he, he certainly didn't love him for his own merit. He didn't, this is not why he would be in heaven at all. But God gave him the grace at the end of his life, to do something very special, and it really shows us the love of God and the love of neighbor very well.
not only through Jesus, but through a man named John Harper. John Harper was a minister back in the 19, uh, 1900s, earlier part, and he was on that fateful night, that fateful ship, the Titanic, one night. Back on April 14, 1912, 1,528 people died in the frigid waters. Six were spared. And one of those six persons was a person by the name of Aquila Webb. And he stood up four years later after the Titanic sank, and he recounted the story of what John Harper did for him. And the story has to do with how John Harper had his daughter and his niece on board. And they were going over to America to, to proclaim the gospel at Dwight L. Moody's church. And they were there. And, but the ship went, was going down. And so he got, his, he got his girls safely in a lifeboat. But then what did John Harper do? He jumped into the frigid waters with a life vest on. And he went from raft to debris telling people about Jesus. Just telling them about Jesus. And he would say, do you know God? Do you love him? Are you saved by his grace? And he came up to one man, Aquila Webb, and he went up to him and he said, do you know God? Do you love him? Do you, do you want to be forgiven for your sins? And Aquila Webb said, No. And so John Harper went away from him, and he came back, and he said no again, came back. And I don't know, it was in the third or fourth time, but John Harper took off his vest, and he said to the man, you're going to need this more than me then. And he gave him his life vest. Now that would be enough to break my hard heart, but it didn't break him. But it was somewhere in the next several hours when John Harper had already sunk down to the depths of the frigid water, that Aquila Webb cried out to God and said, forgive me for my sins. Beloved, that's a great example. And see, as great as John Harper is, John Harper loved God and loved his neighbor by doing what? Telling everyone about the one who can save, the one who can deliver, the one who kept the law for us and wants you to see him. we got to see Jesus and believe on him more. He is the one who hasn't just saved us from the drowning of the Titanic, but the one who has delivered us from eternal condemnation hell. Praise be to God. There is a Savior. His name is Jesus. Would you pray with me? But Lord, we thank you for the grace that you gave to John Harper to share the gospel. And as we think about ourselves and when we have that grace, we feel very unworthy. And we're convicted, if not already, by the way that we fail to love our spouses, our children, our, our parents, our siblings, and, and our neighbors, even our enemies, Lord. We're convicted. And how we don't love you, Lord, would you forgive us? I pray, O oh Lord, that your people would confess their sin. Perhaps even why I delay in praying, as it were, that they would cry out to you and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for my lack of love. Forgive me for my doubting of you, O oh God. Forgive me for my fear and lack of love for my neighbors. Lord, I pray your people call out to you and they would hear those wonderful words that, that John Harper even said. That if you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, everyone who does, you shall be saved. Lord, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.